my body, which was laying on that gurney, began to lift. It began to float. It began to lift up off that gurney. And then as I'm getting closer, I begin to see people in this and, and they're screaming and crying and waving their arms and, and their arms are on fire. And, and then I begin to know, realize that I knew some of these people. Hi, I'm Janie Duval. Thank you so much for joining me. My guest, Ron Reagan, saw hell. Yes, he actually died and saw hell. He was a very violent guy and you have to hear his story. Now, later on, he's going to explain what he sees coming for America. Ron, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Janie. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm so excited because I remember hearing your story years ago when I produced your show when you were on Sid Roth's program in the 1990s. And I never forgot it because it really impacted me because I thought about people that I know who may not know the Lord and who can end up in hell. So I want to take you back. I want to know what made you so violent? What made you so angry? What happened to you at the age of nine? I was uh, a typical mountain child in, in many ways, but uh, my father was an alcoholic and we were poor, you know, no electricity, no indoor plumbing of any kind. And I had to walk a uh, probably two miles to catch a school bus and uh, knew nothing about God or religion or church. I was just a typical, in terms of back then, we were just called hillbillies. Mm -hmm. But uh, something happened at that age of nine that, that set my life on a course uh, downward and very destructive and rebellious. But uh, uh Oftentimes, uh, we were beaten, my brother, my sister, and myself, and a very abusive father when he was drinking heavily. And we had uh, very little happiness to speak of. But one day as I was walking home from getting off the school bus, I, I had to walk through the woods. And there was a little widow lady that lived there in a log cabin. Her name was Miss Ollie. And she stopped me as a little boy and said, son, I'd like to give you a gift. And uh, nobody ever gave me anything. Uh, I didn't know how to respond to that, really. But she, she said, follow me here to the corner of the house. And I walked around with her. And, and there, there was a baby lamb. Mm. And she picked that little lamb up and handed it to me. And I held that little lamb's body to me and I could feel its heart beating. Oh. And, and I'd never been given anything. We had nothing virtually, mm. but I carried that little lamb home and I'm wondering all the time, I wonder if my dad will let me keep this. And he was in a good mood that day. And he said, you keep it, you keep it out of my way. Don't want to be any, uh, bother to me, it's your responsibility. And that lamb became my friend. And when I didn't have anybody else to talk to, I would just talk like that little lamb was listening. And as the days and weeks rolled by, I knew where that lamb would be every day. I knew where it would be feeding down by the fence row. And one day when I came home, uh, the lamb was missing. And I could hear my dad cursing and screaming, and I knew he was mad and angry. And I got near where he was uh, working on an old car. And I, I could see my lamb laying on, on the ground. But when I got close enough, Janie, I, I could see red blood all over my, my little friend. And he had got in my dad's way, and uh, dad had taken a tire iron and just uh, plunged it through that lamb's body. I just, and, uh, I, I uh, mean, what were, what was your feelings at that moment? Uh, brokenness, ab absolute uh, hysteria, probably. 
and I and he just beat it, you know, it was just bloody. And at nine years old, I began to scream out and run. I, he's killed my lamb. He's killed my lamb. So we lived at the base of a very tall mountain. And I ran up the side of that mountain screaming and cursing and just, you know, so angry and I was crying. And and when I got way up the mountain, I laid on the ground and I beat the ground with my fist till they were bloody. And and uh, cried till I couldn't cry anymore. And then I, I made myself a promise. I said, I'll never be hurt again. <sighs> If anyone gets hurt, it will be someone besides me. But I I didn't realize what was happening, even at nine years old, in that fit of rage and anger and hurt, uh, evil spirits entered my life. Exactly, changing you, changing who you were. Yes, and, and, and it really did. From that moment on, nine years old, uh, I had such hatred and bitterness and anger. And uh, I was uncontrollable. By the time I was 12, I had been in three different juvenile institutions. And, of course, they tried every way to straighten me out. They tried through. Back in, back in those days, they whipped you. Oh, my. It, uh, this was this was way back there, you know, and and all kinds of disciplinary ways, and of course, didn't lock up in juvenile cells and and all that. But uh, I'd been in three different juvenile homes uh, since dis- in those times. But finally, they just said, "You're you're a, a habitual, you're a habitual juvenile delinquent." And, of course, uh, a lot of verbal abuse and physical abuse, even from the different places I was in. Wow. So that just added to it. Oh, yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm i sure I had low self-esteem. I was constantly battling the temper and the rage and the beating the walls and bursting, breaking things and and just uh, all kinds of things. But by 15 years of age, I was uh, uh, totally, totally uh, manipulated by the enemy, by Satan. And I didn't, you know, I didn't really know what it it was. One thing I did not realize was that rebellion was as the sin of witchcraft. You know, in the Bible, when you read in First Samuel 15, it tells you that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know any of that. So, right. uh, you know, crazy things. I would I wanted to hurt people. I wanted to destroy things. Uh, pain was something that I got high on. And uh, yeah, you were totally out of control. I mean, you were not yourself anymore. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I thought, uh, you know, I'm hated. Nobody cares for me. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. And uh, at 15, I stole a car and had some other uh, teenagers with me that was uh, just about as bad as I was. But uh I lost control of that car. I really didn't know how to drive. And then that car accident, uh, uh, a lady was killed uh. and three other teenagers were crippled. And I laid in the middle of the, of the road uh, when I regained consciousness. And, and I could hear the rock and roll music blaring on the car that was just twisted and laying on its side and, and I could hear people crying and groaning and screaming. And, and I was in a pool of blood myself. But a Tennessee Highway Patrolman looked down into my face and he said, he said, young man, and, and I knew he was probably angry and emotional. And, uh, but he said, I'm charging you with manslaughter. Now, were you fearful at that moment? Not, not really. I was just in a daze and... and uh, 
Uh, he said, I'm charging you with manslaughter. That was the charge back then. It, nowadays, I guess it would be vehicular homicide or vehicular something. Now, did you but, have any remorse for that someone dying? Well, I, I, in a sense, I did, but uh, only momentarily. Mm. So I was in the hospital for a good while myself, and and uh, when I was uh, released and taken to uh, the court, and they tried me and convicted me of manslaughter. I was fifteen, and in those days, they you know they put chains on your feet and chains on your hands. Oh my! And they transported me to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, to a place called Jordonia. And how long were you there for? I was there for the uh, biggest part of a year. And And uh, what happened after you came out? uh, Well, when I finally got out of there, nobody wanted me around. You know, the the county, the police said, we don't want him back in this county. And uh, so I I took off. I just took off and I wound up in North Carolina and uh, actually over in Lenore. And I got a job in one of the furniture factories, but I wasn't old enough to, to work a public job. I lied about my age and registered for the draft, and and uh, but I couldn't hold a job. I was in a fight with everybody, the foremans, the supervisors, and yeah, I love the fight that, you know, seemed like it just brought that rage out in me. So in, in that thing, I, I just, uh, and then of course the alcohol and the drugs, so many different kinds of drugs, especially uh, speed and benzodrine, dexedrine and drinking alcohol. and Were you, addic- Were you addicted at that point? Yes, yes. I think uh, the addiction and uh, it brought it brought something out of me. It released something in me that uh, otherwise uh, you, in, in other words, it was just complete more, uh, possession, so to speak, uh, but areas of my life that I d- didn't even know what what it was. Which and, uh, which, which drugs really? Pharmacia is can, it can be like another form of witchcraft. Oh yes, yes. And now you know now through the years I I've learned that. And but you're ex- you're exactly right. And uh, you know I, I always fighting with the police from one. That was a form of authority, and I couldn't stand it. You know, like many times I've been beat senseless, and 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 I don't really blame them because I initiated the conflict. Uh, now, in- now you were um, when seventeen years old, you got married, and you married your wife, who was fifteen at that time. And yes. um, now, how did you treat her? Well, I loved her. I, you know. When we saw each other, it was like uh, something I'd never experienced. And it was, there was a connection. Uh, but her, you know, she grew up in Chicago and her dad was a bartender in, in Chicago. But she wasn't violent or nothing like me. And uh, so immediately we got married and she just told her parents, you know, I'm, I'm marrying him whether you like it or not. But I brought her into this lifestyle, Janie, horror. Uh, you know, I I was constantly robbing people, strong arm robbery, beating people and robbing them. And, and then, then up to stores and service stations and running all over the southeastern United States and robbery and, and drunkenness and, and uh, hallucinations and and I thought uh, every time someone looked at me I thought it you know they were talking about me or they that uh, used to get so uh, paranoia right paranoid. right so it turned everything turned to paranoia and insecurity rejection yes. yes and if anyone looked at my wife I would shoot them or beat them or I mean I would just so horribly jealous within this but this in this lifestyle of children you know, we started having kids and I had no relationship with them I actually 
when I'd look in a mirror, I would break the mirrors, you know, with my hands because I, I could see my father's face. And I hated him than anything. You know, I couldn't school teachers, police officers, anybody in authority, I, they were my enemy. So uh, and I, my wife couldn't handle this. You know, it's, uh, I'm ashamed to say, I, you know, I beat her. Mm. And uh, my kids would hide from me. And uh, so this became worse and worse. And finally, I would be gone months at a time and they wouldn't know where I was or I wouldn't know where I was. But usually I'd be in one jail to another or, or somewhere on a long binge and drunk. And Now, how did she want to stay married to you? She she tried for a, a long time. She she tried her best. And finally, she had, she just left because she knew the kids couldn't live and she couldn't live. But she went back to to her parents. She is still just a kid. I mean, we. Uh, but Satan doesn't care if you're a kid or a grandparent. He wants to use you to bring harm to the kingdom of God mm-hmm. and right. God's creation. And now, and in now, uh, what happened? So, bring um, um, I want to bring you to that day in 1972 when you were 25 years old and yes. you had your little son with you, and you yes. walked into a store. Yes. My son was five years old, and I, I was so, Elaine would try to help me. She'd lock me in, in the bathroom or someplace, but I'd bust the doors down and break the windows out to get out, to go get alcohol and drugs. And and, and this was one of those days. So she said, take Ronnie with you down, down the street to a 7-Eleven, just down the street. Started in that store, and uh, someone was coming out of the door. But, you know, my anger, he shoved the door, and that's all it took. I mean, I, I shoved back, and but I didn't stop there. I just started beating him down into the floor. And But he didn't stay down. He, he got up with a broken 16-ounce bottle and started stabbing me. First wound cut my left arm almost off. The way the bottle was broken, it went right across the biceps muscle and oh. cut it in the main artery and I was bleeding all over the floor uh, people were screaming and people that uh, customers in there and my little boy was hysterical he saw all this and and every time my anger this guy was stabbing me and I kept kicking him and hitting him and every time you know he was cutting me finally the the guy that w- worked at the store come over and said you've got to you're bleeding to death you're bleeding to death. You've got to get to a hospital. You, you're dying. Right. So in, in a, a matter of time, they put me in the front seat of a car, passenger side, and drove me to an emergency room. And by that time, I'm almost gone. And I, I can hear them talking, but they're trying to help me, give me IVs. And, but they said, we can't help him here. He's got to go to a, to a larger hospital. So they put me in the back of an ambulance and was going down the highway and I'm there on the gurney and a young man, the paramedic in that ambulance looked down at my face, 25 years old, uh, bleeding ulcers. My brain cells were damaged in many different ways. Uh, I had bleeding uh, whelps on my body from alcoholism and nerves and he looked down in my face this little guy did and he said sir uh, you're in you need uh, help you need Jesus help well I didn't know what he meant Janie and I I, I began to curse him I took if I didn't understand something I lashed out at it mm-hmm. uh, so and you, and to, you probably lashed out when you didn't understand it because it probably made you feel even more insecure. It, yeah, right. that's true. Right. That is so. So, and, uh, what did, I mean, had you ever heard about Jesus at all? Not really. Interesting. But no, in my family were, you know, we were just, uh, uh, we knew how to make whiskey and we knew how to, uh, you know, survive. But um, he said, sir, 
uh, Jesus loves you and he'll help you if you'll call on him. Well, it, it, something about that name just infuriated me. I began to curse Jesus and curse him and, you know, and all that. But in this, but in this rage that was making me, I'm bleeding to death and I'm shaking the whole gurney I'm laying on. And uh, just the ambulance just began to fill with smoke. And I didn't know what it, I thought it was an electrical fire. I thought the thing was on fire. But it filled that ambulance and, and I, it was like an electric welder, like uh, just, yeah, I couldn't breathe. So it smelled like, um, what did it smell like? Sulfur, you know, if you've ever smelled sulfur, it mm. uh, was awful. And then my body, which was laying on that gurney, began to lift, it began to float. It began to lift up off that gurney. And as I went up into the smoke, I could look down and I could still see my body laying on the, on the gurney. And I'm moving through this smoke and I, I don't understand what's happening. And, and as I got faster and faster and uncontrolled, just tumbling. And, and, and then as if I come out of this smoke, I look down and I'm, st I'm still very emotional about this, even after all these years. But I'm looking down into like a lake that's burning. It, like uh, when I was a kid, we'd pour gasoline on top of water and set it on fire. And it was something like that. But the smoke and the fire and, and I'm falling down into this. And then as I'm getting closer, I begin to see people in this and and they're screaming and crying and waving their arms and, and their arms are on fire. And. And then I began to know, realize that I knew some of these people. I got close enough to see their faces. And one of them, uh, uh, he's screaming, Ronnie, don't come here. There's no escape. There's no way to get out. I mean, what did you think? Did you have any thoughts of where am I? I did. And I, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know where I was. But this man I'm talking about, he was shot to death robbing a, a liquor store in Atlanta, Georgia, in the 19 early 60s. Mm. And he's and he, you know, he, he he was a horrific death. It, it, actually, they shot him in the back and blew his heart from out of his chest, and he laid on the sidewalk and was just dying, laying there in blood and broken glass. But he's screaming, Ronnie, don't come here. There's no way out. And I don't understand this. And I looked at others that I knew uh, that I knew that had died violent and horrific deaths. And they're screaming for me to not come there. And just as I feel like I'm dropping into this, my, my, I felt like an electric current went through my body. And I opened my eyes and I'm in a hospital room. Wow. And my little wife, my little wife was sitting there beside me. And and she said, Ronnie, you're going to live. But you've been in surgery most of the night. And you're full of uh, stitches and sutures, and but, but you're going to live. But immediately when I came conscious, I t asked her, I said, Elaine, don't let them turn the lights off. Oh, wow. So you all for once had fear. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I've never, I've been cut. I've been shot. I've been uh, abused in many different ways. But some, whatever had happened to me, whatever I'd seen and whatever I'd been, I, 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 I didn't, you know, it literally did bring fear to me. So what and did the, your wife? What did your wife think? Like, did she see anything manifesting? Even though I know she didn't know Jesus at that time. Right, just a a, a wildness. She said in in my eyes, just a wild look in my eyes, and a and a uh, fear of of uh, uh, nervousness and fear. And so, uh, 
but I was in the hospital for a good while. And when I was released from the hospital, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that the first thing I tried to do was get drunk and get high. Probably very, trying to, yeah, probably though trying to not, yeah. Re- yeah, so you don't have to remember what you saw. And the voices I heard and the smell I was just right there, just. I couldn't get it out. I couldn't get high. I couldn't get drunk to get rid of that. So I came I, I, I came home where we'd been staying. Came into the, actually walked in the bedroom. The light was on and, and my wife was sitting up in the bed. And she was glowing. I mean, her face was shining. And I I. I had the the impression somebody else was in the room bes- besides her. Oh. And I, 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 you know, actually looked looked around, and she looked up at me and and she said, Ronnie, she said tonight I took the children, and I went to a prayer meeting. And tonight, Jesus Christ came into my heart and life and saved me. And I I didn't understand that terminology, but I knew something was different in her. The wrinkles that I had caused to be in her face, around her eyes, seemingly would just disappear. She would just smile. Now, what's interesting to me is that you didn't have your reaction to hearing his name what was your reaction this time? Because the first time with that paramedic, you were so angry. But what was your reaction of hearing Jesus's name this time? It was it was curiosity mm-hmm. and perhaps a deep hunger. Mm-hmm. Something uh, I knew I didn't have. And uh, she said, uh, the only hope, the only hope for you is Jesus. And the only hope for our marriage is Jesus and and our family. So she said, would, would you would you go with me and the kids to to a prayer meeting to church? She said church, and I didn't know what church was. Mm-hmm. Never went. I thought it was just a place where nice people dressed up went to and didn't mean anything, yeah. you know, to me. But I did. I, I, I said, well, you know, I guess I've tried everything in, on this earth that I, you know, and and uh, I went with her on November the 2nd, 1972, to a little church. And when we went in in this place, I sat down in the back row with her and the kids and a man got up to, to speak, and I didn't even know what a pulpit was, mm-hmm. but he got behind this box, I call it, and he said, today, when I was preparing for this service, the, the Holy Spirit instructed me to read St. John one twenty nine. Well, that didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know anything in the Bible. But when he started reading that, that passage, something that began to happen to me because that verse said, behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And he said that lamb is Jesus Christ. It's God's son. The son of God is called the lamb of God. And, and Jeannie, for the first time since I was nine years old, hot tears welled up in my eyes. And I hadn't sensed that since childhood. Mm-hmm. And I sat there weeping and crying. And, and I, I thought, you know, he's talking about my lamb. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the way I'm related to that. <laughs> I know. Out of every scripture, it was a, a miracle that he used miracle. that scripture. Yes. To, to, to bring something to me that took me all the way back to my uh, worst day in life, mm-hmm. probably. And I, I tried to, to 
to get up and get out of that place. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't, this, this presence was pulling and drawing me. So I started toward the front of the building instead of the doorway. But it was like a thousand pounds was on me. And my legs gave out from under me. And I fell flat on my face in front of all these people. And, and I didn't want anybody to see me cry. But these little ladies come up beside me and started patting me on the back. And she said, uh, son, you're, you're uh, on the Roman road of salvation. And I didn't know what that meant. And some other little lady came and you know, trying to help me. She said, she said, son, just pray the sinner's prayer. But I didn't know the sinner's prayer. It, it didn't really mean anything to me but I knew they were trying to help me, but I cried out. And, and this was my sinner's prayer. I cried out with tears falling down my cheeks and my nose running. And, my, and I said, God, if you're real, if you really exist, if, if you had a son named Jesus and uh, you, uh, and he died and shed his blood. And that's all I could see was the blood of my lamb laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. And he shed his blood for Ronnie Reagan from Kaler Holler, Booter's boy. Then please, God, kill me or cure me because I don't want to live anymore. Nobody trusts me. My kids are afraid of me. I, I can't hold a job. I'm, I'm nothing. I'm just a derelict. Please kill me or cure me. At that instant, Janie, God answered both those prayers. He killed the old man. Mm -hmm. He created me a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. The what Lord. did you feel like? Oh, my. Uh, I didn't know the terminology then, but it was joy unspeakable and full of glory. <laughs> That's I, I looked at my wife and, and my kids, and they looked like uh, angels to me. Oh, and, oh my God! <laughs> it was it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And you know, uh, my Bleeding ulcers were healed. Oh, wow. Physically the, the, healed too. Absolutely healed. The, the nervous whelps left my body. My, my, evidently my, I don't know how many brain cells was destroyed, but, but immediately I could read and think clearly. And, and, and as the years have gone by, it's, it's been a miracle after miracle after miracle my family, you know, God has a sense of humor. My son, that five-year-old son that, that grew up and saw all of this is, is a sergeant in law enforcement now. He's a police officer. Oh, interesting. And it's always been his thing. And my, my daughter, my oldest daughter is a pastor's wife, and she's a minister herself. Mm. And uh, my baby daughter is well and blessed and uh, we have five grandchildren and four great grandchildren now how how many years have you been married now we've been married 56 years and i, I mean it obviously god like totally transformed your marriage and it, now also you were addicted before to drugs and alcohol what happened to the addiction wonderfully enough God delivered me from that. I mean, just totally, absolutely. And I've been told that's impossible. And I've been given kind of scenarios. And, and it took me a while to uh, come to grips with that seemingly doesn't happen to everyone that way. Mm -hmm. But as I live my life, I know that God, spared my life and did something wonderful for me 
to share that as long as I live. And totally to- transformed you. And you've seen amazing miracles because I know you've prayed for the sick all over the world yes. and have seen creative miracles. And um, can you just like name one or two creative miracles that you've seen? And uh, God has sent me to, to almost every continent of the earth. And number one, to share this story and also to preach, you know, the gospel. And in, in the country of India, perhaps the most amazing thing, I'd been on an airplane like for three days just getting there and transfers and all. And when I got there, I, I lay down. I was sleeping a while with a gentleman's family I was staying with. And when I woke up, he said, uh, get up and eat pineapple. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I look, and I looked out the window and people were lined up as far as I could see the line going down the road. Now, this is Kerala, India in the, in the 70s. Now, were they lined up anticipating a meeting or what were they lined up for? Yeah. They had heard there was an American missionary there, and then they'd come and just started lining up for prayer. And he said, let's go. And and so I got up and went out, prayed for a few people in the front of the line, were touched wonderfully by the Lord, fell on their faces, weeping, crying, repenting. About the fourth person in line, they had carried him in on a stretcher. And the translator said, this lady lives, they've been carrying her for two days, coming out of the mountains. She said, God gave her a dream that there was an American missionary coming here to speak. And if I would go, if I would get there some way or another, that God would heal me. Well, that's a wonderful desire. But when I looked at this woman, Every part of her body was twisted like pretzels. Oh, wow. Legs, her arms, her neck. When I looked at her, you know, I I thought, oh, God, what can I do? And the Holy Spirit says, it's not you. (laughs) He said, just lay your hands on her and pray. And some of the other ministers with me. And and Janie, no sooner had we started praying, and they were praying in Mali, the Malayalam language. I'm praying in English. And I heard something crack. I thought the stretcher had broke. You know, though it was just nothing more than wood. And I watched as her legs begin to straighten out. Oh. And it was like crack, it was like breaking sticks and wood and her legs straightened out and her arms straightened out with the same crunching sounds and and her little if you ever saw how little the little Indian people are from India the country of India that part and she was almost like a little doll laying there but she was an older person Mm -hmm. And her head straightened up and her and her and her she opened her eyes and looked up at me and she said, Yesu Christo Jivikanuam Jayam Hallelujah. And I asked the translator, I said, What what is she saying? And he's wiping tears and shouting. And he said, She said, Jesus Christ gives me the victory. Uh. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Oh, after that happened, thousands of people started coming. Oh, my goodness, because did all these people see what happened? Yes, yeah. <laughs> and uh, before that meeting, we were out in the open field in the jungle with a power generator. And the, the, the people feel they sat on the ground. They don't have any chairs. They sat on the ground. And the trees were filled. People were up in the trees. And kept watching, and, and the uh, the radical Hindu people, they they didn't like that at all. So every little bit, they'd cut the wires to the generator to kill the loudspeakers. And the people that is accepting Christ, uh, they you know they'd watch and then they'd tell 
you know. And if, and if they accepted Christ, especially if they followed in water baptism, they were rejected from their family. They strictly took their family name away from them. In other words, they were nothing. They just became a, a, a cast or outcast. And so many, oh, all night. We'd, and I'd, they'd have to hold me up to minister and pray for people. And I was only 26 years old. I mean, I was in in the days people would line up and and the, the Communist Party came and tried to just run us off and, and make us quit. And the, the Hindus and finally the, the demon possessed people started showing up from everywhere. And some of them was trying to throw snakes at me, poison snakes on me. And, so one of them tried to give me poison and, and uh, just they weren't, it wasn't necessarily me. It was the Jesus in me that they hated, that they right, were. Right. And, and I just kept preaching. I guess for two weeks, I kept telling them that we're stronger than the strong man. <laughs> mm, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Now, um, I know you've seen so many other miracles, but I we did tease in the beginning of this video. What do you see coming for America? Do you think we have any more time or do you think the Antichrist is going to come tomorrow? What do you see? I see. Uh, and I'm telling this everywhere I go, Jenny, which is a, a massive number of places, big, little, large or small, interdenominational, whatever. If they want me to come, I'll be there with the grace of God. What I see is God is speaking to his church, his body, his people, and saying, I'm standing at the door. If you will open and ask me in, I will come in. And I will sup with you or fellowship with you. And from that will birth a great awakening and a move of God. A, I, I really believe Jesus is coming after a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And so, so you believe that the Lord is going to come back after the church starts really moving in power and not compromising? Yes, absolutely, Jenny. I believe it is. I believe the greatest need in the American church right now is hunger and desperation. Not, not, uh, uh, not prosperity, not uh, being better and more classier and more entertaining than everybody else to be the humble servants and children of God. That's really what I sense and what I feel. You know, I'm not adverse to, to numbers and, and blessings, but these all these things can never take the place of the glory of God on the crown of his creation. So do you see a remnant of believers saying, yes, God, yes, Lord, we want you first more than anything, oh, and that yes. big revival will happen all over the United States? I, I do. And maybe uh, it, it might not be everywhere. Mm, pockets. Uh, it's in pockets, or uh, like when the children of Israel were under the protection of the blood, light shined in Goshen. And there was darkness over all of Egypt. But there was light shining where the blood was prevailing. That's one thing that's, that's uh, you know, I've been preaching now for 46 years. And, uh, you know, and, and like Paul, it's not me, but it's Christ in me. And what I sense is the the greatest power, the greatest power that's in our reach is that same blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. 
I love worship and, and you know, the blessing and the, and the charisma and the feeling and the emotion. I love worship and praise and all those things. They're wonderful. I, I enjoy them. But just ask yourself the question. If, if we could ask ourselves the question, how much of it is lifting up the blood of Christ or even mentioning the blood of Christ? or even mentioning a sanctified life, a right. committed life. Right, where we're totally, totally changed. Ron, could, we, you, could you lead us in a prayer of, if, some, if some, some people don't know the Lord, to lead them in a prayer of salvation, but also lead us who do know the Lord to have more of a hunger, to let him be first in our lives. Yes, I'd be glad to, Janie. Thank you. Father, as we come to you today in agreement with Sister Janie Duvall and with all of those people that are hungering and thirsting after the righteousness of God. I pray in the name of Jesus for every prayer warrior, every intercessor, every person that's, that's, so desirous to see the presence of God manifest in our nation, in our churches, in our families, God. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray for every drunkard, for every addict to whatever kind of addiction they may have. I pray for every person that's bound in rebellion that may have iniquity bound in their heart father in jesus name i pray for the holy spirit to bring conviction bring conviction to our lives and our hearts and show us the way lead us in the light lead us into the light of God for only the light of God can show us our ways of failure and sin and transgression. I pray, Lord, as I've spoken this testimony and your message around the world, Lord, I've told so many people, Lord, and in my own homeland here of the United States, please, God, Please touch the fathers and the mothers and turn their hearts to the children once again. Oh, God, I pray, help us to realize that we can never, never be truly saved until we recognize we are lost. Father, in Jesus' name, help people to cry out to you for only godly sorrow can work repentance and in jesus name we thank you for the way the truth and the life you paid the price you did not owe oh god and we owed a debt we could not pay but thank you jesus for your death on the cross and your burial and your resurrection and right now as we're praying here, you're praying at the right hand of Father God for mercy, forgiveness, grace. Lord Jesus, let people confess you and receive you into their hearts and believe with all of our heart in Jesus' name. And you said if we would do that, we would be saved. We thank you, Father. Thank let you. people phone or write in and let sister Janie know and then Lord she can let me know but God I believe you for salvation full Thank and you. free yes. for people to be delivered from Satan in Jesus name we break his power and stand on the authority of the risen son of God in his name we pray amen
Amen. We just thank you, Father, in the name of Yeshua, that yes. lives are changed in Jesus's name all yes. over the world, that you now know who Jesus is. You can hear him. You can see him because you've committed your life to him. Ron, thank you so much for being on my program and just huge blessings to you. And if you like this video, put a thumbs up. Please share this with your friends and hit the notification button too. Thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you, Janie. Thank you.